welcome to Sir Henry Fraser, His Life in Focus. I'm Miles Eversley, thanks for joining us. In our last episode, Sir Henry recounted the establishment of the George Allen Chronic Disease Research Centre and its successes. His autobiographical journey continues with his departure from the centre. So in 2005, I was able to leave the centre alone, as it were, in the capable hands of Professor Hennis. But then he moved on to PAHO. He became an assistant director at PAHO in the field of chronic diseases. And so he then was succeeded by Professor Clive Landis. And Clive, as I've said, is this brilliant guy who was a great planner. He was like a chess player. He could see all the moves. And he was great at getting the research funded and carried out. Uh, when then Professor Landis moved on to the University Centre at Cave Hill, he uh, ceded the post to the next director, who was Dr. Alafia Samuels. Now, she was a public health graduate of the UE, so she brought a more public health perspective to the centre. Professor Landis had brought the laboratory uh, angle as well as the epidemiological angle, and she added value in terms of public health, public health studies, public health research, public health reports. But Alafia was close to retirement age, so she then departed and she was replaced by Simon Anderson, Professor Simon Anderson, who is both a fully trained scientist and a medic. And so he is now able to bring together all of the perspectives that we have had over the course of the center, which is a little more than 25 years, and which was celebrated with the wonderful Feshrif for me at its 25th anniversary. And I have great hopes and great expectations of the center moving forward under Professor Anderson and the contribution that he will make. Now, what about the deanship? When I took over as dean, the School of Medicine, it was called the School of Clinical Medicine and Research in order to express the relationship with the research center. It was a very modest organization and Sir Hilary Beckles, when he came to Cavefield campus as principal, coming back as it were, he looked at the budget and he said, you know, we have almost as many staff as we have students because we were only teaching the last two years of the clinical five year, of the medical five year course. And he said, why don't we have a full faculty? There's a full faculty in Jamaica where it started. The faculty in Trinidad began in 1980 and we're still only doing the last two years. It's uneconomical. And he said, go out and plan for a full faculty and how we can develop it. So I was tasked with developing a feasibility study, as it were, and a proposal for a full faculty of medicine in Barbados. And what I did in that period uh, was completely different to what I had anticipated when I took over as dean. When I took over as dean, it was a matter of simply trying to strengthen the faculty um, get one or two new staff, strengthen the public health, pediatrics, and so on, and to in, in, inspire in the students a as humanitarian an approach to medicine as possible. Because we have had an issue in Barbados and across the Caribbean where people go into medicine because they think it's a good career to have and not necessarily f because of a passion. It's very nice when you interview a medical student and you discover, well, they've always wanted to be a doctor because they've wanted to help people. Or granny had cancer when they were six and they felt, if only I could do more. So those kinds of things were very relevant. And so I developed a, a clerkship in what we call ethics and humanities with Professor Walron, who had written just written a book on medical ethics for Caribbean medical students. And that was important in terms of getting our students to think more in terms of the ethics of what they were doing and not just in doing the job of medicine. The big problem at this time, of course, was the fact that I was still directing the Chronic Disease Research Centre. So I was literally working 12 hours a day. And you might ask, well, how did we achieve the successes we achieved because of this? Uh, I always had the philosophy expressed by Winston Churchill that a pessimist sees difficulties in every opportunity. An optimist sees opportunities in every difficulty. And so I learned, particularly during this period, 
to manage stress because when you are running two units, two institutes, two organizations and on different sides of the road with very different kinds of people. You have researchers on the one hand, you have medical students, you have faculty, you have hospital personnel. It all requires a great ability to manage stress, to roll with the punches. And one of the things that inspired me was the discovery of a philosophy of the guru of business management in North America called Ken Blanchard. I came across a book he wrote called Whale Done. And the principle that he was exposing in this book was that of the whale trainer, the killer whales which perform in Orlando and places, marine world. Uh, these killer whales could, at a stroke, kill the trainer. And so Ken Blanchard took his grandson to watch the killer whale training. And at the end, he talked to the trainer and he said, how do you do it? He says, well, Unlike a dog, where you can train with a carrot and a stick, and you can tap the dog on its nose if it's bad, reward it if it's good, the killer whales can only be rewarded. You must not upset a killer whale. So you have to reward them everything they do, every time they do something good. It's a matter of catching the whale when they do something good. And he applied this to his business principles and his business management training and he said catch your staff and your team doing something good and reward them and I have to say that my stresses as a manager suddenly became very much reduced when I realized that this is the secret because you know in Barbados we we don't like criticism we're very much against being criticized we all like praise that's human nature and once I started to pick up on the successes, the things that people did best to recognize, acknowledge and praise, then my life became a whole lot easier. So my success was partly due to that. It was partly due to my wife's tolerance, my wife's patience, the fact that I could not be immediately responsive because I had another task to do. And that, that was a huge challenge. But then it was also due to the team. I was lucky to have a wonderful team in the first period as Dean, my first four years, I had Grace Eiffel as my administrative assistant and she was a tower of strength. Very small, but a tremendous tower of strength, a great thinker on her feet and a wonderful support for everything that we did. And she carried on when we developed the full faculty and that was a tremendous boon to me to have someone who knew the ropes, who'd been with the university for a very long time and who could help me at every level. That was a tremendous advantage contributing to the success of the deanship. But then Sir Hilary Beckles came along and he said, we've got to have a full faculty. Do the job, get it done. I then used my vacations for two years visiting all of the new medical schools in Britain, of which there were five. I went up north to Lancaster, uh, down to Keele, nearby to York Hull, and then down in the south to the University of East Anglia and to Peninsula University, Exeter and Plymouth. And I visited all these schools and I saw what modern new curricula were like. They were rather different to the original curriculum where you spent hours dissecting cadavers. Uh, they utilized some of the principles of what we call problem-based learning, which was the main theme of teaching at the St. Augustine campus. And so what I saw was this more modern approach from these five medical schools in Britain and the Northern Ontario Medical School in Canada, which was designed right up in the north of Ontario. And it was very much like the Caribbean situation because it was catering to communities which did not have the state-of-the-art urban medical centers. And I learned from all of them. And I developed a proposal. And that proposal was then fine-tuned by Sonia the business officer, Sonia Johnson, and finally by Ernst & Young, who worked out all the figures as to how much money was needed and how many students would be needed to pay back what was going to be a bond issue by the government to the university. Now, all of this was being done in the year leading up to the World Cup, and my paper was sent, my big document was given to the Ministry of Finance on December the 1st of uh, 2005, Cricket World Cup was in 2007. The government sat on this document for a year and a half, 
waiting to see if Cricket World Cup would bankrupt the country and whether they'd be able to afford this medical faculty. Now, Sir Hillary had made the point very clearly that we must do this. It's, this was something that had to be done because it was uneconomic to continue. And we were at the stage because of certain things in the hospital which had harmed its reputation. We were on the stage where after having a university for some 60 years, that we were still importing doctors from Nigeria and Pakistan who had to culturally accommodate and who didn't have the same sort of training. We had multiple problems with some of the doctors who came from overseas and contracts were terminated. So it was very ironic that the government would sit on a proposal like this for a year and a half. They finally gave approval after Cricket World Cup at the end of April, at which point Sir Hillary said, well, I know the development of a medical faculty normally takes several years, but you have got to do this in 15 months. How do you achieve the impossible? <laughs> And here's where Nelson Mandela came in <laughs> with his quotation about achieving the impossible. <laughs> and we did it. We had to build a building, which we had planned, admittedly, but we had to build a state-of-the-art pre-clinical building with laboratories and teaching labs and everything and lecture theatres. And we had to hire staff. Now, hiring staff is a tricky business. Because if you don't have a huge academic medical community in the Caribbean, where are you going to get the staff from? So you have to import them. So in fact, we acquired staff from Britain, USA. Canadians didn't want to come because we had a problem with dogs. And the ones we were trying to recruit had dogs. And we had a, a rabies thing about Barbados. So our Canadians never did come through. We had people from India. We, we had people from Nigeria. We had the works. And hiring people on the basis of a CV or letters of reference is always a dicey business. Because if you are a great friend of your boss, even though you may have your deficiencies, you're going to get a five-star letter of recommendation. Because he knows your deficiencies, he likes you, but he wants to replace you with somebody better. So he writes a glorious letter of recommendation. Anyway, we were able to get the faculty going. We hired some wonderful staff. Some of the outstanding people who joined when the faculty opened were the pharmacologist, Dr. Damien Kohal, who also does a good TV presentation. I saw him talking the other day about medicinal plants on television, and he's doing good work. We had Dr. Kenneth Connell, who is one of the stars of the university's medical faculty here at Cave Hill. And he's one of the people I persuaded to succeed me as clinical pharmacologist. So he is your hypertension specialist, working with the WHO, working with CDC in Atlanta, doing the research, leading in hypertension and clinical pharmacology. Our anatomist, Dr. Uma Gore, she's from India. She's a wonderful person who came to Barbados. Uh, like many people coming from India into the Western world, it's a, it opens up great opportunities, and I think it did that for her children as well. But she has been a tower of strength and a very hard worker who is studying, teaching, and publishing. So we're proud of all these people. A psychologist, Dr. Michael Campbell, brilliant psychologist, because I wanted a clinical psychologist. I thought it was crucial to medical training and to the university's role in public education. Because among the roles that we have to play as medical teachers in the university, uh, not just the teaching, but we have to manage patients. As Sir William Osler said, to study medicine without books is to, sh to sail a rudderless sea. To study medicine without patients is not to go to sea at all. You really learn your medicine on the patients in the hospital bed in the clinic and so on. And you have to extend that in the wider way with medical public education. So I was, I was very keen, therefore, to have all of this range of people in our faculty and to develop a curriculum that was a blend of the more traditional curriculum in Jamaica and the more modern curriculum in Trinidad and I think that is what we did successfully and we had a wonderful team 
of new faculty working with the older faculty and particularly working with the hospital consultants because my philosophy throughout life in the research centre and in the medical faculty has been one of creating partnerships and the partnership that operates between the government employees in the hospital and the university employees who are actually reporting to the university to the principal directly through the dean. This is a partnership that has yielded wonderful results. The medical faculty could not have existed without the larger number of hospital consultants and hospital staff. So we've been able now in recent times in developing the postgraduate training to have a succession parade, if you like, of the medical students who do their internship then go into postgraduate training where the postgraduate training came from the senior hospital staff, Professor Hassel, uh, Professor Corbin, Professor St. John, all of these senior people working together with the university trained people, Professor Mosley, Professor Prussia, myself, and so on, Professor Warren. And that kind of partnership has been the secret of the success of our medical faculty. So with the new faculty now, it was an opportunity for me to do the things that we didn't have the provision to do in the first instance. It gave us an opportunity of promoting research, it gave us the opportunity of opening up the faculty to the public, as it were, because the, the roles of the medical teacher are teaching the undergraduates, teaching the postgraduates, managing the patients in your care about whom you can teach these two groups. You are then expected to do research, relevant research if possible, and you're expected to publish or write about that research. Then, in addition to these five functions, you are expected to play a role within the university. You must attend meetings. You must carry out a role, maybe it's an appointments committee, whatever. And the more senior you get, the more of those roles you have to play. That's number six. And number seven is interfacing with the public because there has been a constant criticism over the years that the Cave Hill campus was an ivory tower and we all had all these economists and social scientists up there who could talk what they talk, wanted to talk about but there was little relationship with the public and the people of Barbados. So we wanted to make sure that our medical faculty had the public health strength that it could partner with the Ministry of Health and at the same time do the job of public education. So that was a hugely important philosophical change. When I became dean, we had one lecturer in public health, and now we have a public health unit of four people who are doing amazing jobs, amazing research, and interfacing and partnering with the government. Take, for example, the role that the university has played with these public health doctors in the evaluation of the COVID epidemic. It was these university people who were able to say, look, we are in grave danger when we opened up. We will have a spike of four to 500 new patients with COVID every day. And that prediction on the modeling done almost six months ago as to what would happen if we opened fully, and of course it has happened. So it, it's terribly important to understand the value of the kind of research that properly trained people can do. And here I might conclude this section of the work of the university, the work of the new medical faculty, by saying that research is essential to guide policy. Policy is essential for planning. Planning is essential for programs to deliver health care. So it is a logical chain. And so currently, what the Chronic Disease Research Centre has done is to establish this wonderful partnership with the Ministry to produce the data which will guide the policies, the planning and the programmes for the delivery of best health care to Barbados and to emanate through the publications that we produce with the rest of the Caribbean who are so similar to us in so many ways. Of course, all good things come to an end, and I finally ended my deanship. Uh, I did one extra year over the proscribed, legally, legally recommended period of eight years as a dean. I had to do one more extra year 
uh, persuaded by Sir Hilary Beckles, who is perhaps the most persuasive administrator I have ever come, across, ever come across. I've always said, you know, the people that I have known include people with a personality that very few people ever disagreed with. They had such a strong personality, and these included Prime Minister Michael Manley, Prime Minister Tom Adams, and Principal and Vice-Chancellor Sir Hilary Beckles. He can be extremely persuasive. Now, he wanted me to do a third term, and I said, no, I have other tasks I wish to do in the remainder of my life, and therefore I will do one more year as dean, and I did that one year so that we had this historic class coming through, and I was able to teach them and mentor them for two full years. It was a wonderful opportunity. It was a huge challenge, and as, I, uh, as Mandela said, things seem impossible until they're done and then you have great satisfaction that something has been done and it's worthwhile and there's a team that has been part of that and it's the teamwork that is so crucial. I was lucky to have a wonderful deputy dean in terms of my older friend, Dr. George Mayhe, psychiatrist, so that he could counsel me, he could advise me, he could see if I was getting stressed out, for example, but he had a wonderful way of evaluating everything and then he was succeeded by the orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Jerome Jones, another wonderful deputy dean to have to work with in my last few years. And Dr. Jones, of course, was like me, a law school graduate, which made a major contribution to his success and to his skills. And finally then, I came to retirement, and they had a wonderful week for retirement. Uh, Dr. Hennis organized all that. He knew that I was from St. John, so the week began with a service at St. John's Parish Church with lots of my old St. John friends, and it was a very emotional and tear-jerking occasion. And we had a, we had a, a lecture. I, was a, I gave my last lecture on some of my philosophy and the things I've talked about in, in, in this interview. And to my amazement, in the middle of that lecture, into the lecture theatre walks my son Rob from Britain. My wife was always very good at organising for Rob to appear for special occasions when I received my Vice Chancellor's award uh, during that last lecture when I was knighted. Rob, who has a family in Britain, an enormous work commitment, she would arrange for Rob to come down, send him a ticket, and he would appear for events like this. So it was a very dramatic. Uh, evening that lecture and the camera people were able to catch capture a picture at the end of the lecture when Maureen and I had a kiss and the front page of the nation the next day showed this famous uh, brilliant kiss between my wife and me in the lecture theatre behind the, the crowd of a full theatre so that was a great event and then we had a banquet and the banquet came off very nicely and I was allowed quietly to require to retire and go into the night but in my last lecture, I mentioned like a dozen things that I intended to do. I intended to contribute infinitely more time to my wife and my home and my garden, which was very special, and to preservation. I had made a promise that I would give five years to preservation work, which I'll talk something a little about later on. But I also wanted to paint, I also wanted to write, I also wanted to talk. And so I suppose that's what I'm doing now as well as my radio programmers, which I'm also very much enjoying. So I have not retired, really, I have retreaded. And so, Sir Henry set out on a new path. Interestingly enough, that new path which led us to the inscription of Greater Bridgetown and its garrison will come under focus next week at the same time. This has been Sir Henry Fraser, his life in focus. I'm Miles Eversley. Thanks for your time.